Uh, evacuation centers are uh, not some place uh, that you would make reservations for. Uh, in other words, it's going to be very austere. Uh, it's going to be very basic. It, it is just like the term uh, sounds, it's evacuation uh, center. Uh, this is where we bring people in uh, to get them out of harm's way. That's the sole purpose. Uh, it's going to be very uh, austere, uh, very bare bones. Uh, there's going to be uh, sheltering and protection from the elements, uh, basic food, water, but not much more than that. Yeah, so you need to bring some of those items. You need don't to just bring some show you up. Need, don't, and don't show, show up and uh, uh, you know, don't plan on making dinner reservations. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to be served with anything. And so whatever you could bring with you, just like in your emergency kit, bring that with you. And this is important, Sarasota County operates those for us. But yes. A lot of those locations are here in Norfolk because we're away from the coast. Correct, yes. And most of them have now, if not all of them, have become pet friendly. And yes. that's a big deal for folks. Absolutely. And I don't know, for our family, uh, our pets are our family. Sure. Uh, we treat them just like any other member of the family. We make sure we have their papers, we make sure we have their food, uh, make sure we have a place for them to stay because they're going to be separate. They're not going to be with the families within the shelter themselves. They're going to put, put in another safe area. Uh, just because within the shelter itself, you might have people who might have allergies uh, to pets. So we want to keep them safe, uh, but be prepared to take care of them. Uh, be prepared to go take a look on them every now and then, but be prepared with them just like you would any other member of the family. Yeah. And in years past, it used to be only certain ones were pet friendly, but right. now pretty much, they, and, and they knew that that was keeping people from going yes. and getting out of harm's way. Yes, so. and we understand that, like you said, uh, pets are a very, very important part. And sure. so we want to make sure that we're accommodating them yeah. as well. Um, as far as COVID's changed a lot of things in our lives, right. I can imagine in a evacuation center, <laughs> it's you know how do you how do you how do you balance that? Yeah, one of the things that we've had to do uh, over the last year is kind of provide more spacing between groups. In other words, you come in with the family, you're kind of be generally located with your family, but you'll be a little bit more distance separated from other families. Uh, the difference is a lot of times now there's not a lot of mingling. In other words, you don't see people walking around talking to each other. And they kind of stay within their groups uh, just to maintain that social distancing, just to make sure that everybody's safe, uh, staying healthy, uh, but they're out of harm's way. But again, it's a little bit more limited in terms of the actual social interaction. Lots of options. Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, March 3rd, 2022. It's 1 p.m. We are in the city chambers, and I call the city commission special meeting to order. Commissioners present are Commissioner McDowell, Commissioner White, Mayor Emmerich, Vice Mayor Langdon, and Commissioner Luke. There is a quorum present for this meeting. Also present are City Manager Fletcher, City Attorney Slayton, City Clerk Taylor, Recording Secretary Baker. I have Deputy Chief Morales in the back, along with Division Chief Hurley. I'm calling on Commissioner Jill Luke to lead us in the pledge today, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ma'am. I will request a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. <laughs> it sounds like an echo. Okay. Second. <laughs> I have a motion on the floor to approve the agenda made by Vice Mayor Langdon, seconded by Commissioner Jill Luke. Anything to that, ladies? No, sir. 
Okay, go ahead, Commissioner McDowell. I was wondering if we could move item C to the 4A. Discussion about the historical thing. Since that gentleman is here, that way then we can focus on the staff related items first. Commissioner, is your oh, audio? What can we please move item C to be 4A? Since the gentleman from the Historical Cultural Advisory Board is here, that way then we can focus on the staff related items afterwards. That's what I was trying to get in before the motion to approve was, was made. I think that would be appropriate. We mentioned it after he had left in the last meeting. Poor individual had sat that entire time, mm -hmm. so we did talk about Can I make an amendment, first. Mayor? You can make an amendment, yes. If uh, Make an amendment to move item C to be for item A. A second. I have a motion on the floor to move item C uh, before A. And that was made by Commissioner McDowell and seconded by Commissioner Luke. Anything to that? No, sir. Okay, please vote on the amendment. And that passes five to zero. And please vote on the main motion. As amended. As amended. Thank you, Mayor. And that passes five to zero. Okay. City Clerk, is there any um, public online public comment? There is not. Okay. I have some in-house public comment. Mr. Hale. Mr. Alan Hale, sir. Uh, I'm with the Allen Hill Northport. Uh, just want to remind uh, all of y'all and the historic uh, advisory group that uh, this Monday, we uh, about 5:30. I don't know in this chambers or at least here, we are having a uh, discussion about the uh, topic. It may you may be uh, see that it's related. Uh, that is, let me read it. <clears throat> Discussion and possible action regarding scheduling a joint meeting with the Historical and Cultural Advisory Board regarding designating Pan American Boulevard to Little Salt Springs as a historic area. So I thought that was related since we, we do have the historic board here today and let them know that will be 530 this coming Monday. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, moving on to general business. We'll be working on item C. <coughs> this is item 22-2053. City Manager, will you introduce the item, please? Absolutely. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this item is a discussion and action on the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board recommendation. We do have staff, Mr. Noah Fossick, who was here to deliver a presentation. He is not only uh, in our planning department, but he is our liaison to the Historic uh, and Cultural Advisory Board, and there is a presentation included. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Noah Fossick, staff liaison to the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board. Uh, I just want to preface this presentation. The presentation will be made by board member Chris Sterner. Um, just to say that the cult a cultural resources assessment survey was completed for the portion of the Mayakachi Creek that will be discussed today in 2019, and the full report can be made available at your request. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Chris Sterner. <coughs> My name is Chris Sterner. I'm a member of the cultural, Historical and Cultural Advisory Board. I'm here today um, with the understanding that members of the Historic and Cultural Board is that our tasks 
who advised the City Commission on Historic and Cultural Matters. Uh, and it is our, also our task to propose tasks or actions to identify and preserve those sites which may be of value to the city. The advisory board has discussed several sites where further research, possible preservation, and marking may be appropriate. The first of these, actually two items. Um, the first is the suspected turpentine dock and adjacent still. I personally examined these sites in 2009 and again in 2011. In 2019, the board was informed that much of the lumber comprising the dock was removed during a city cleanup along the Myakahatchee Creek. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shortly afterward, a personal examination, my personal examination, revealed that this was the case, but the still base is remaining. Um, <clears throat> the picture on the left, just on the left, yes, the picture on the left is what I pictured or uh, photographed of what was remaining of the turpentine dock back in 2009-2011. The picture on the right was a picture I took in 2009, which it appeared that someone was using it as a party site, um, and I have further pictures with which will explain why I believe this is the turpentine steel basin. <clears throat> uh, the, suspected, the suspected turpentine dock and still are located along the Makahatchee Mac Creek. Um, the entrance to the site is approximately 100 to 200 yards south of the intersection of Sylvania Avenue and Silver Palm Street. Um, it is approximately, it is less than a mile from this building. My research indicates that much of the land, approximately 80,000 acres, was located in the North Charlotte County area, because at the time we were part of Manatee County, and <clears throat> when they organized Sarasota County, Sarasota County was, was made up both of parts of Manatee County and, Port Ch and Charlotte County. <clears throat> the land was purchased by a Mr. A.C. Frizzell, Um, between 1918 and 1920, and, and, and it comprised, by the time he had finished purchasing land, which included much of Northport, uh, 80,000 acres, as I mentioned before. On his way, one of his many pursuits, turpentine production was one of the first. After depleting the pine trees of their sap, he sold the dead trees for lumber. When the lumber was gone, he turned into cattle business. Eventually, Frizzell began sending off, selling off his land in the late 40s and early 1950s. It may logically be presumed that one or more of the satellite turpentine processing sites was located in what is now Northport, in the area now under discussion. But further research is necessary before a definitive position can be taken on whether that preservation and marking would be appropriate. The second site is really a, a section of uh, the city of Northport. It's the rail, be uh, rail bed of the Charlotte Harbor and Northern uh, Railroad, possibly a loading stop, located near the northeast corner of Northport city limits. I personally examined and walked the length of the line within the city limits. No rails or rail ties currently exist as those elements were, were torn up in the 1970s. But the rail bed itself is still recognizable between the Charlotte County line and the Soda County line. And again, I walked the entire thing, which is only about uh, five miles. <clears throat> According to certain maps that I acquired, okay, uh, let me read, read, read. Go back on myself here. The reason I suspect that the turpentine still is a still a basin is if you look at this picture on the left, it shows the uh, brick uh, structure on which the turpentine still was mounted. And if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see that concrete, uh, I won't call it a structure, but that concrete thing 
uh, and there were bricks around it. There were more bricks there at the time in 2009. Well, that is a picture from 2009. Um, I also discovered some metal <laughs> ceramic parts and pieces of what I could identify from the picture on the left as being parts of a still. I will go now back to the rail bed. When doing my research on this, um, CNN rail line was completed in 1907 and crossed with in what is now Northport from the Shaw County line, as I said, to the DeSoto County line, a distance of between three and five miles. The line parallels both Yorkshire and Raintree streets. It was the main line between the docks on Gasparilla Island, now Boca Grande, and Arcadia, which was a junction of several rail lines that carried cargo throughout the country. Um, the primary transport cargoes for the CHNN were turpentine, lumber, cattle, and phosphate. According to several maps, the train schedules uh, of the period 1910-1920, there was a stop in the current north port known as Evilan. And if you can, it's really hard to see right down in the corner, a, right up near the number 25, if you can see, well, it, there are two 25s there. At any rate, I, I suspected that it was a site, a depot, not a train station, not a rail station, nothing like that. It was a depot for onloading cattle, onloading lumber, onloading whatever um, in that area. I could not confirm it, as I said, this all needs to be researched more thoroughly. I, I only had certain resources to do this. Um, again, train <coughs> schedules indicated that there was a stop here. It was not a train, was a train stop. It may be cautiously assumed that Mr. Frizzell shipped some of his products from this way station. With the city having little documented history between the paleo history of the two springs that we have here in Northport and the uh, history that was written from uh, 1959, um, there is very little information about Northport or the Northport area. Um, I know it's hard for people to, to picture that Northport wasn't here as a city. That is correct. But the land was here. The land is always here. And what's on this land is part of our history. People destroy it. People try to change it. But it's here or was here. Um, I presented what may seem insignificant in and of themselves. They are or are or may be part of the city's history. The further research and investigation firmly proved that, it actually, that they actually existed. Um, they may prove, they may provide another picture of what occurred in the city now, where the city now stands from its founding, uh, prior to its founding in 1959. And that is pretty much my presentation. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, they're coming up. Uh, do we have any commission questions? Did staff want to speak to the presentation? Sorry. Uh, staff has nothing to dish. Uh, Commissioner Luke. Thank you, sir. I understand that it is not validated that any of these suspect um, places are legitimate. The question that I would have in regards to the turpentine still, would there be enough water to convey uh, the product, the turpentine up and down that, if that was supposed to be a mill and a dock rather than a loading dock for cattle. Correct. And or not even a loading dock, but a bridge for, right. for cattle too. I mean, is there enough water in that um, waterway to have boats go up and down to to carry heavy turpentine. As, a, as an historian, I look at things not in the 20th, 21st century. I look at things of what happened in the early 20th century, late uh, 18th, 19th century. 
And <clears throat> from what I can see, and the discipline of history doesn't cover just history. We cover archaeology, we cover geography, we cover geology. There are lots of ologies that we cover when we do history because we don't rely on just the written history. You can't do that. I looked at the, the banks of the Mayakahatchee River. And if you go there and look at them, the water level is way down. Even in the best of times when it's flooded, it's way down. I have to look at it in 1920s, 1910 area that possibly, and again, it's all possible. I, I don't profess to say that it is what it is. That's why it needs research. And as I said, my, my resources to do the research were limited. Uh, I did this all on my own. Just anywhere I live, I want to find a history of the, of the area. Um, but you're right. It, it looks as though you can't do that. But my perspective here is that there was nothing coming up, nothing coming up. Everything was going down toward the Market River. So consequently, they could put on a small barge. And this was, remember, this was a satellite still. This was a major still. So they were getting several barrels maybe uh, in a month. And they would put them on a barge, send them down the Mackahatch to the Mack River. And from there, they took it to wherever they were going to put it on a ship and send it out. Uh, so that was my perspective on it. But, but it's a good question because you're right. You look at it today and you go, they couldn't possibly do that. Hope that answered your question. It, 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 it does. Um, that is actually the only question that I had, Mayor. I've got other statements when we get to that point. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Commissioner White? Well, that was one of my questions, too, about about that, that doc, and um, I don't think I have any other, any questions, but I... Comments. Like comments, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, uh, and I'm not too sure who to direct this to, if it's to staff, city manager, or to you, but um, we received, as part of the backup material, a letter from, a memo from um, Mr. Speak, uh, and I was wondering, has the advisory board seen a copy of that letter from Mr. Speak? Okay, uh, I copied the same information that you're talking about, and I understand that the survey was done in 2019. In one of our month, one of our meetings in early 2019. Um, we asked, I asked about, we had, at that time, we had the, I think it was city mayor, city manager in, at that time, whoever it was. And I asked him the question, uh, did anyone check with someone as to, because obviously they tore this dock out when they did the cleanup. And I was told that they saved the lumber over at the facility on price, which whether they did or didn't. <clears throat> so I asked the question, why wasn't anyone? And I was informed that we can't take the time to check with people before we take clean up places. Well, if there's a structure there, and you're tearing it apart. Wouldn't you want to know what that structure was? Or is it significant in any way? We were told, no, you didn't, they didn't have the time to do that. There are several things that I, I read into that supplemental material. One of the things is, and I realized when they did the survey, they had an archaeologist. I have a problem with that. If you only have one discipline looking at that, you're not seeing the picture. You should have had a historian there looking at the same thing the archaeologist did, because they can point out things the archaeologist may not see. <clears throat> Second, somebody in one of the documents that was sent out saying that um, Zeba King owned all of the land here in the Northport area. That's absolutely <clears throat> true. In the 1880s, has nothing to do with the period I'm talking about right now. Right? The period I'm talking about is from 1900 to 1959. Most of the history that I talk about is that period. Okay. I hope I answered your question. No. Um... Uh, and maybe this is something the liaison may have to try and answer. The memo that's dated January 11th of 22 from Mr. Speak um, to uh, Assistant City Manager Balia kind of outlines some of the 
um, references to a cultural resource assessment report that was dated in 2019, um, completed by the Paleo West Archaeology. And it kind of gave a rundown of the thoughts based on the presentation. And I am wondering, has the advisory board been given a copy of that memo to review prior to today? So the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board pulled this item um, in motion for it to go to the City Commission on December 9th at their meeting. So this came afterwards, um, after the memo was sent to the city management's office requesting uh, for this item to be put on the city commission um, on the docket here today. Excellent. So since that meeting for the Historical and Cultural Advisory Board was in December when they decided to make this presentation to commission, then the memo was completed by Mr. Speak. Has the memo gone to the advisory board since then for any meeting in July or I mean, July, January or February? Uh, unfortunately, this was already scheduled for uh, come before y'all, um, before there was another meeting. Um, the next meeting would have been in January was canceled. And then the most recent meeting in February, it was not brought to their attention because this was already scheduled to go before y'all. Um, and I will say additionally that it was brought to Chris Sterner's attention, but not the board as a whole. And he's here representing the board. Gotcha. So I don't want to get him into trouble. <laughs> um, I have one more question. Hang on there. In the memo also that is dated December 14th from the advisory board, it's also talking about the designation of Pan Am to Little Salt Springs. And I think that's alluding to what the public commenter was talking about. Could you please fill in the gaps? I, I, I see that here. I hear the public commenter. I don't know about a meeting on Monday. So if you could fill in those gaps, please. Uh, the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board has not motioned or, or, or passed anything as of yet on that item. It is still a topic of discussion. The, uh, they have requested uh, that they have a joint meeting with the Environmental Advisory Board, and that is uh, what uh, Mr. Hale was here and spoke about, that they will be discussing that at their board if they wish to have that same joint meeting for the same topic. Uh, but that is not, there's nothing definitive uh, decided yet. Okay, so so this is not a confirmed joint meeting. It's just for the uh, Environmental Advisory Board to say yay or nay to the request. Yes, at this point. Thank you. Mayor, at this time, I, I, I don't know if I even have any more questions. Uh, I'd like to hear discussion from my fellow commissioners. I'm not sure if we can take action, so I'll, I'll wait. For discussion thank you uh commissioner Luke, do you have a question i i do okay i'm uh, still on questions so. yes thank you sir because the time periods are vitally important there isn't really any documentation for us to know that during that period of time from 1900 to 1948 where this aerial comes into play we don't really know what the terrain was like, what was going on. We have some written history that we look at. Um, I mean, to validate that those things are really what might be suspect, probably some carbon dating would have to be done to see the, you know, the time frame of the brick, the concrete, the, um, the wood. Uh, so there'd be quite a bit of undertaking to even look at what era of time frame that they would fall in. But let's say, I mean, because there is no evidence at this point, what does the advisory board want to see happen with these couple of areas that are remote and at this point suspect? What is it that you would like accomplished? One of the things that complicates the matter is the fact that Sarasota County was founded in uh, 19, 
1921. Um, prior to that, it was part of Manatee County. And some of it was part of Sarah, uh, Charlotte County. What needs to be done is somebody to go to their records, because obviously there are tax records for Mr. Frizzell, whether they be in Charlotte County or whether they be in Manatee County. They may shed some light on his business workings. And they may also shed some light on the, whether he had a turpentine dock here or not. Uh, but that's the kind of research that we were talking about when, when we're proposing this. It, and it's, it takes someone with a historical background to be able to go through those records and find out what are the tax implications of Mr. Purcell and anyone else that owned land in this area. Okay, let's say somebody did. They found out that the gentleman had some turpentine mills don't really know where they're located, but uh, let's say they found out still, what do you want to do to that property so that, you know, it, it's marked historical right. because they're, they're off the beaten path, all Correct. of them. Correct. And there are quite a few places off the beaten path. I, Part of my background is I was on the Historic Commission for Sarasota County. I was also on the Historic Preservation Board. So, yes, it takes a lot of work to document something. But even if it's off the grid, they still mark it and say, this is a historic site. What that does is it protects it from people going in and having parties and throwing beer cans in that still. That kind of thing is what we're really looking for. Um, if we can't definitively say, yes, that was a still owned by Mr. Brazil, this is all moot point. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner McDowell, do you have a question? Yeah, follow-up question. When the turpentine, when the proposed turpentine dock was removed, I think it was in 2017, staff did say, I saw them actually loading it on the mm -hmm. flatbed. Um, staff did say that they were bringing it to the public works facility right. for storage. Um, is that still in storage over there or has it been completely removed out of city possession? I'm curious what happened to those lumber pieces. We, we have. Mr. Speaks is coming down, <laughs> but I asked that question the we other day. No idea, but. And they an said answer. it was still in storage. Yeah, I, I saw it with my own two little eyes. <laughs> But Mr. Speaks will address that. I saw it many years ago. I haven't seen it recently. So I'd like Chuck to speak. Chuck Speaks, Interim Public Works Director. Uh, we still do have the timbers stored. The timbers from the serpentine dock that was removed is still over at Public Works? I would say from the cattle dock, yes. Okay. Cattle well, crossing. Yes, well, ma'am. That was removed? Whether... The timbers that were removed from the creek and the cleanup are at Public Works. Okay. Uh, when we, shortly after they were removed, we put out to uh, several of the people in, involved with the board and told them they were there. If anybody wanted to come see them or possibly collect them, as we aren't the keepers of such materials, but we have kept them on site. Okay. Um, does anybody have an idea if there can, you know, I see on TV all these old fossils that are found or old archaeological things that are found, and they say carbon testing shows that it came from a gazillion, gazillion years ago. Has anybody checked to see what value, what historical value these may have, how old these timbers may be? Has anybody checked any of that? No, ma'am. No? Okay. All right. That's it. I have nobody else speaking for questions. I'm going to start comments, um, and I want to start myself, and then please put your name up, and then go ahead and put your comment in, in order. You had mentioned earlier about you didn't know about the feasibility of the waterways, if it could possibly have taken barges from A to B or whatnot. The only thing I was going to tell you to remind you is back when Northport was being built by GDU, a lot of the canals were dug. Water was rerouted to different areas. So if you go prior to that, there could have been a main flow through there that carried those barges from A to B. So that would just give them my you know, suggestion on where to start looking is prior to 
the incorporation of the GDU area and stuff and digging the canals. So that's all I had for a comment. So uh, Commissioner White. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Sterner, for your presentation. And just want you to know I speak, I speak your language. I truly um, embrace history. I was on the Sarasota County Historic Commission, in fact, for a while there. Um, I, I, I do have a question. You, you mentioned, um, um, Mr. Frizzell, the El Jobin Cafe has historical book. Did you ever look in that? Because there's huh? history there about the cattle crossings and how that made their way out to um, the river eventually. Uh, I, I'd like to make a comment on that cattle crossing. The difference in elevation between the far side of the creek and where the is awfully high for a cattle crossing. Normally they'll look for even level of uh, terrain to run a cattle crossing. To go uphill, cattle don't do that very well. Right, okay. All right. Um, one of the things I used to do as I taught in Rotunda was have a field trip that traced the, the railroad line out to Boca Grand Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And Cattle Dock Point Road is called that because that's where the cattle were driven to, correct? Um, but that, that um, dock, I, I think it's irrelevant if it was um, what it was used for. It would be interesting to find out, but it definitely was something that was built deliberately. It had, I don't know what you call it, rebarb or something that was holding it in place. So it wasn't something that people just threw there. It, was, it definitely had a, had a purpose. Um, I do agree with, with the still to have that validated because um, I've, I started running hikes along the creek over 20 years ago. And I remember on one hike, we came across that. We, you know, I pointed out that circle. And somebody there said, you know, he used to hike the creek as a kid, and it wasn't there when he was a kid. This is what he claimed. So, um, and it's always been questionable what that was really there for. So when you, some, you mentioned about testing the, the age of that base to see what materials I suppose it's made out of to, to validate that. That would really you know, solve that once and for all. Was that just built as a party pit <laughs> or, or what? But I'm just sharing that. That's what somebody had, had told me back then. Um, and, um, but I, I do agree with you that the, the history is in the land, and the land is what it is. And it, it does have a story to it, and um, we do have to respect it and and understand what was here before a general development was here and what it was used for so people have a better appreciation of of um, the world, basically. Um, so I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I appreciate the conversation. I love history, especially learning something new, I learned about the railroad crossing because of the railroad line because of this uh, discussion point. Um, I don't know if for me, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but for us to say, yes, make this a designation, I don't think we can do that at this point. It's so premature. Um, I. I would like to see how how do you go about validating something like this? What is involved with validating something like this? I'm sure it's not cheap to validate something like this. Um, the timbers, are they of value historically? And all of this has to be, in my opinion, really looked at in detail before we can do any type of designation. And I don't even know if this is how long something like that takes. I mean, does it take a couple of weeks if you're working on it 40 hours a week? Is it something that you have to really research and do nitty gritty? I mean, this is, we're talking 100 years ago. Records weren't very well kept 100 years ago, um, although sometimes they were extremely well kept 100 years ago. So you do see both sides of that. Um, so I, I could not say yes, make this a designation until we have absolute confirmation. And I think by your you and your board bringing this forward and putting it in the mindset that we have to do this or we should look at this, I think is very wise. Um, we don't wanna lose history. We don't wanna lose something that could be of value 
to us, I mean, we are only 60 years old. And I think Charlotte County or Manatee County could be helpful with those records. How do we go about doing that? Uh, people way smarter than me have to figure that part out. <laughs> so thank you. Well, that's exactly why I prefaced my presentation by it needs to re be researched. We, we're not proposing that we accept this. Okay. I, as a historian, I wouldn't accept it. But when I see evidence upon evidence that this may be something, I say, please research it. Is that it, Commissioner McDowell? It is, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Vice Mayor Langdon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, when you come back, or let me back up. I also appreciate history. My grandmother always said, if you don't understand your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So I do value that. Um, should this topic come back to the commission, I'd also like to have an idea of how you would use these sites as an educational opportunity. Unfortunately, the still is in such a state. I don't know whether it's a still or a campfire pit or so even if we were able to do some testing and find that it was from that period, what would it tell us? I mean, how would we educate our kids on the value of that? What would it really tell us? I don't know if you'd recreate a replica, but, but I'd be interested in what your thoughts would be in, in that area. Just a perspective on that. I've been to hundreds and thousands of historic sites. Mm -hmm. Some have nothing except mm -hmm. green grass. Mm -hmm. But there's a plaque there. Yeah. It has a picture of what the still looks like. Mm -hmm. and this was the still that was here, or this was the uh, structure that was here. Right. And that's the kind of thing, if we could validate this, that I would anticipate would be a good teaching thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you I was you also for that. a teacher, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have to bow to you and Commiss Commissioner White when it comes to the educational opportunities of these things. But I think it would be important, what, whatever we might do there, if it were validated, that it would be useful. To, to kids to really give them insight as to what North Port was like 100 years ago. Thank you. Commissioner Loop. Thank you, sir. I wish there were some way to know right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and there's not enough history to say that it's legit right now. Uh, to, to validate it, it's going to take work. It's going to take consultants, it's going to take money, it's going to take uh, carbon testing, which is time and money. Uh, I mean, it would be cool to walk down the creek path and there's the marker and, you know, it gives you history. I don't know if we're in a place as a city to pay for that. That type of digging into history is usually done by a historical organization that resides within a city and they take those type of things on through philanthropy and that uh, the only monies we have is taxpayer monies and to expend taxpayer money to research that I don't know if that's in the best interest of our residents um, if there was some way somebody could donate or a philanthropy come through to to support this or donate toward it uh, I got no problem because as I said I think it would be really cool to walk down the path and there's a surprise and you get to see some history if it's legit but I, I really can't support um, without knowing how much money it would take who would be in charge of it hiring a consultant to look into it I, I can't can't support really going any further with with this topic. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, um, I appreciate what Commissioner um, Luke just had mentioned. I have to wonder, does Sarasota County have a historical um, group, a historical 
board of some kind that may be able to assist with this? They do, but most of our concentration is North County. Of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> there, there is a uh, Sarasota County Historical Society um, that's obviously not part of Sarasota County government, but a separate organization. Uh, okay, so has anybody reached out to them? I mean, it, we are part of Sarasota County, and and maybe they're looking to spread their wings and explore new new unchartered territories. And um, there, when I was on the historic commission, there was very little interest because I I brought it up there, obviously, and there was very little interest in pursuing anything down here. They said there was nothing down here but cattle land. Which is but what, I'm which sorry, is, but what? There was a, the only thing down here was cattle land. Because oh, cattle Bertha Palmer land. had her ranch north of uh, River Road, and all these people had their ranches here. Unfortunately, they don't look at the time frame that some of these people had their ranches, which predated the time frame that I'm talking about. Um, so we, we can do that. We can, we can try and get in touch with them through. Yeah. You know, it's it's worth a phone call, letter, whatever, um, to say, hey, we found this, we have this, we would like your assistance. And <coughs> it, it, it benefits all of us. Right. Sarasota County, Northport, the citizenry, and, and possibly even Charlotte County and Manatee County because that's part of their older history. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that's probably if... if well, it's a step into another perspective. Prior, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say that at the previous Historic and Cultural Advisory Board meeting, we were brainstorming um, goals for the next year, this calendar year of 2022. And one of those was to potentially seek partnership with local historical societies um, in, in some of the endeavors of the board. Thank you. And again, another perspective of that before this board was formed, and I have to say I was the first board member, um, I tried to organize a local historical <coughs> group so that we could do exactly what you're talking about and got very little interest. Mm -hmm. I had, at the most, five people show up, and that was sporadic. Mm -hmm. So... My term here is almost up, and I'm going to try again. So if that's any consolation. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Sterner, for your diligence in this, and I appreciate your your knowledge and sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner White, and then we're going to be wrapping this up. Yes, uh, and yes, the Sarasota County the Historic Commission, they're pretty much involved with unincorporated areas because the municipalities have their own they do have their own historical mm -hmm. places set up. And like you said, there was little interest, unfortunately, in Northport to do that, but that's where their money comes from to, to do that. Um, the, the item says uh, recommendation to develop plans um, pertaining to documentation. So can't we move forward to at least have a consensus that this is worth pursuing? Like we brought up the, the thing about validation. Can we at least have a consensus maybe to agree that it, it is worth pursuing and, and the, the, how it's going to be paid for, put up the, at the back burner? Well, this would also be putting this on to staff to come up with those plans. And I don't think we have, do we have, city manager, we don't have any staff members in for historical agendas, do we? No, sir. Okay. See, we, we don't have the staff for it right now. It'd okay. be like maybe at budget, go ahead and creating a new position like this going forward, but that's a bigger, bigger discussion than what we're having right now. We don't have staff in place right now. Because if we don't take any action now, this is just going to get dropped, and we're never going to have validation, correct? I'm just wondering, like, when surtax time comes up again or we shuffle those funds around, which I learned we can do when in budget times because we did shuffle money around, if this goes away, that's not even going to be brought to the table. I'm just trying to find some way to keep it even in limbo so it doesn't disappear. I mean, this, this board has gone through a lot of work and trouble here to presentation and talked about it. Um, I, 
May I? Go ahead. Uh, I, see I, I don't I don't mind keeping it active, but not in house. Uh, we as a commission give directive or jobs or projects for the boards. Uh, I have no problem with them reaching out to the Sarasota County, City of Sarasota, um, Manatee County, Charlotte County, reaching out to them to pull in some information of the history, uh, looking at that sort of stuff without expending funds. So I have no problem with them researching further, but to, ex to spend anything, no. Um, Hopefully those other entities who are funded by philanthropy and such, um, if there, if it looks like there's some validation to it or potential validation, maybe they could provide the resources. Okay, so that, that is a possibility that the board themselves could, could reach out to find out what's entailed in validating something, what are some of the costs, so like you said, yes. so we don't have staff time that's involved. With right. that, and, but they can do that and say, this is what we found. Now here's the next step. Right. And this is our advisory board. Once they go through some of these steps, they bring it back and say, hey, this is what we found out. This is where we need help going into the future. And what we did was we just opened up the doors to have this initial conversation today to give them direction on where they need to go because we don't okay. have the resources right now. It doesn't mean that we can't discuss it in any budget hearing right. or whatever. According to the okay, so we just need, we just need another another it's, piece of the puzzle. Right, it's it's okay. not dead. This All is right. we just open up the doors on the conversations. Okay, I just want to make sure it doesn't just die after all this discussion and. No, discussion. it goes okay. back to them, to their board, and they they check their avenues on how they can figure okay. out things and you know hopefully get some assistance like from the society up there in Sarasota. If not, then they come back to us in the future with hey, this is what we need. Okay. We have open decorum with the boards. Okay. Thank you. Do we need to give them the green light to continue with that? No. Uh, I got the green light. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got the green light. But I, I, I believe it the should be formal because they do yeah, we have to work do and formal. sit under the commission. So I don't think just debate or discussion needs to happen. But I think there needs to be a formal We'd like allowing to them. Right. I think there should be. Too often our advisory boards don't hear from us and, and get our input on things we would like them to proceed with. And this is a perfect opportunity to say, hey, the commission gave us the green light to go ahead and do 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 do. And that may help you with your research too. The commission has given us this authorization to move forward instead of, hey, we're a group, we want to do it. So I think it's a little bit more formal, absolutely. Um, and, and I think it just kind of holds a little bit more water. Exactly. And that's fine. We can take a motion. Anybody want to prepare a motion? We need a motion or consent? I'd rather, if you want to do it, I'll, let's I'll do make it with a, a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion that um, we put an action item to our historical board uh, to pursue avenues to seek validation for the turpentine mill, the turpentine dock, and the railroad section uh, through societies in the county of Sarasota, Manatee, and Charlotte, as well as any of the societies within those areas also that are private mm. historical societies. Yes. I'll second. I have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Luke. Uh, City Clerk, did you catch that? Yeah. She's going to have super it? fast fingers. <laughs> I was hearing that. I was hearing that. We put an action item to the Historic Cultural Advisory Board to pursue avenues to seek validation for Turpentine Mill, Turpentine Dock, and Railroad Section. Through, through societies in Sarasota, Manatee, and Charlotte counties and historical societies within those counties. Thank you. And that was seconded by Commissioner McDowell. Um, I would take it maybe a step further and see if maybe any state historical 
may have some information. Um, I, I think you would reach out to that anyways, but I know there is a ton of history up at the state level that may be um, helpful. And I don't know if that would need to be in the amendment, uh, make an amendment to include state, but I think historical societies. Um, so I, I, I like the motion and I like having it. Please vote. And that passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to hearing more. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Cerner, uh, thank you so very you. much. Love listening to your historical you. stories. I'll start teaching again. <laughs> I'll attend a class, sir. OK, we're going to move backwards to item A, and that's 22-27. Uh, city manager, this is your item. Yes, it is. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> this item is for the discussion of possible action from the comparison list of all nonprofit public leases. The direction from the city commission back in September of 2021 was for us to compile information regarding all the expenses that were uh, as a result of all nonprofit public leases. So that information has been provided in several charts. Uh, we do have a presentation today by the Interim Public Works Director, Mr. Chuck Speak. In addition to the information that he is going to um, discuss and answer questions on regarding the leases that have been established, uh, we are looking towards establishing a policy that we will bring back in front of you that would allow us to govern how we lease property to our nonprofit. Um, and it was a good, good discussion, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Speak for his presentation. Good afternoon, Commission. Uh, Chuck Speak, Interim Public Works Director. Uh, as the city manager said, we were requested to provide information regarding the city leases. We've done so in the spreadsheet. Uh, the city manager's office also tasked us with producing a policy bring back for their review, which will then obviously come to commission for review once that's complete. So as an overview, uh, and I'm going to dig into the policy side of it more than anything of what we're looking to put in this policy, the, the data that was provided to you is what it is. If you have questions for that, we'll, we'll try to answer that to the best of our ability. Before we start, though, I'd like to say that uh, the leases in the city were very widespread. They were controlled by just about every other department there is. Uh, public Works, we have the real estate coordinator now. We've kind of pulled that together. Um, we are still digging in and gathering information on these leases. The information is not easy to find. We're trying to get the historic information so we can see where we were to where we are. So that's why some of those on some of the documents, and there was some confusion about the color coding on some of those documents. That was because we're trying to gather everything from beginning to today. So we want to see where we started, how we transitioned, and where we are. So some of those things we're still trying to uh, shore up some of the information because they may be long gone. Uh, but that's the reason. And this is a lot of information to compile. Okay, so our overview of the policy, uh, we're going to have a purpose in our policy. We're going to, of course, have all of our de definitions and a statement of policy. Uh, as far as procedures, you're going to have your property criteria. Okay, if it's a nonprofit, it's not a, what, what will qualify to be a nonprofit. Uh, public benefit use of space criteria. We're going to spell that out. Of course, we're looking at other municipalities to see how they've done this. Uh, and when we put this together, we will also ask the attorney's office to make sure that we are within the within the law with the policy that we create. Uh, there will be annual review requirements. There will be annual renewal requirements, and there will be terms of tenancy. And then there will be uh, clauses for termination of policy on both sides. 
and the goal is to be as consistent as possible moving forward with these leases. Um, they will all look the same. They may have different provisions based on what facility they're, they're leasing, but they should all have the same backbone. Um, some of the actions you'll see from here on, we will, as I said, generate this policy. We have a draft. It's a very rough draft right now. We have a good starting point. Um, we intend to then put this policy up on the city webpage. We will then have to add new rates to the city rate schedule to address the policy and the, the locations and the lease, uh, lease rates, because we would like to generate lease rates that are fair uh, based on square footage and type of facility. And then there will be centralized management of the lease contract. And again, that will be housed in public works by the real estate coordinator. And that's all we have for our presentation. If we have questions about the data um, or any discussion thereof, I've got business manager Garrett Woods with me. He compiled most of this data and put it together. And we will try to answer to the best of our ability. Oh, my screen's messing up over here real quick. And they didn't put their names on. I got to get my screen fixed here. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Commissioner White. Okay. Um, Sorry. Well, I had some uh, questions. I don't know if this is the time, but uh, when I read the, the leases, it said there's a minimum hours listed of 32 hours. That means how 32 hours they would occupy that space. Is that what that means? So um, my name is Garrett Woods. I'm the business manager here for the Public Works. Um, so if it stated that within the contract, we were able to identify that on that tracker spreadsheet. Um, and that was the initial read that we put that data down down for you. OK. Is there any way to that that's verified, that they're actually utilizing that space and that uh, so that it's not just an empty unit for? Most of the time, I mean, I just, I'm just curious. How do you verify that they're actually in that space for 32 hours or five days a week providing that that service? That's part of the process for the re, the, the, the creation review. of this okay. document and template. Was first gather the information. The next part would be to then establish it and then go out and double check and verify. Okay, because that, that was one of my concerns just from hearing from people that have called me that it's a, the, the people aren't there at that particular office. And I don't know, my other question was, do we get into, are they volunteers there? Or are they staff? Because there was always when I would call some of these agencies, they say, well, they have a hard time getting volunteers. Well, that makes sense, but that means then you have hours of nobody being in that unit, which could be used. And my other question was, could some of these units be double duty? In other words, if you say 32 hours, I don't know if that's like, it has to be 32 hours. Maybe it would be better for some of these agencies to say, look, we can't staff it for 32 hours, but we can do it for half of that. And this way, somebody else could utilize it and therefore serve, have more. Would that be something possible? And, and these are all provisions that, that can be written into the policy. If we if we have an organization that, or, or if we decide that we want to have a required presence at that building, uh, we may be able to do that. We would it would be a fine line uh, if they're paying a lease for a facility. That's kind of their facility to lease and open and close as they want. But we can put language in there that they have to define the hours of operation, and uh, and that's that's things we would talk to legal about what we were. Like require could, of a of a okay. lease or it could be a shared lease, right? I guess, or maybe just this is your time for for this, and that's just what I'm thinking. Or in, in some places, I know I've been to, and in other parts of the county, it's it's one day a week they're there. So obviously, they're not paying for five days because they're they're one day a week. That's their day to be there, and I guess that's the way to cut their costs. So can we do the same thing here? Sure, I don't see why we couldn't do that. And, and that's kind of like when they lease a conference room or a certain space. Um, if they have rooms and they're not setting it up to be specific to their operation, then I don't see that there would be a problem with that. 
Okay. All right. So don't we do that here with DMV or somebody? They're not here. The tax collector, right? They're but, not here. Yeah, but that's they're set office. up specifically. Their office has their equipment, uh, and it is closed mm -hmm. when they're not here. And that that oh. would be the that would be the catch. If they have to go in and do, bring in all their yes. all their okay. equipment, then they don't want someone else in that space. Okay. All right. And then one thing in your in your um, PowerPoint, you said public benefit. So how is that going to be measured? Like, how do you decide what is the public benefit, or is there a, I don't know. And that would be that would be something that we could require the uh, applicant to provide to us is what what they're intended. If they're coming in as a nonprofit and they're coming in to say that they're going to do something to benefit the city, and they're asking for a reduced rate, they're right. you know they're going in as a nonprofit. We want them to tell us what the benefit is they're going to bring to our residents. Okay, and would that be again validated somehow? Like. Again, some places they ask you for how many people did you serve, things like that. You know, when you go in these places, that's why they have you fill out information because they use that to justify we served 100 people this month or something because you filled out a card. Right. And so typically there is uh, an impact statement where the nonprofit can sort of provide their data that tells, you know, if and who and how many they reached based on what their intentions were based on what they actually accomplished. Okay. All right. And uh, I think that was it. And, and the public benefits side of it would uh, be at the discretion of the board. I mean, mm -hmm. that's your decision to make uh, as far as what kind of benefit you think that this organization brings to our residents. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. So, I know COVID has had a big play on how the public um, the social services building is being utilized. And I know COVID, uh, everything was pretty much shut down. And I'm sure they were still paying their rent. Um, my concern is, is that it's space that's now being utilized not to be open to the public, but to say, hey, we have an office in Northport, but they don't see anybody from Northport. And I am curious if that is part of what's happening at the social services building. Afternoon, Jenna Carrillo, um, social services manager for the record. So I, that is one of my concerns. Um, as you know, the Family Service Center is specifically built to be that one-stop shop and to be, have accessibility um, for our clients. So I've actually reached out to um, our tenants um, here recently. Two of my, one of my tenants, um, JFCS, had two offices, but they were not following the 32-hour rule. So they decided to vacate that, that office space. And now we have um, Empath Health, Tidewell, um, agency coming in and then we're having a um, legal request go up for Meals on Wheels. So we are trying to work on that, making sure that the tenants are following the 32-hour rule. The 32-hour rule was directed by commission probably back in 2016 or 2017. I could be wrong on the date, but don't quote me on the year. So that's why, that's why we have the 32-hour in place. So you are right, ma'am. Um, COVID did create a little bit of, of um, changes and adaptability on how agencies provide the services. We now know, and what I've been telling the agencies when I reach out to them, we now know that COVID is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. We just have to adapt and figure out how to do our services because I'm going to be really proud. The Family Service Center has never shut down since COVID. Um, the services have, have been continued to be provided. So if we could do it, I'm sure other agencies can do it too. So... That that was a huge concern. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that some of the leases don't pay electric. Is the, um, and I have a feeling it's because they share share a building and maybe one meter in that building. Is there a way to maybe get them to pay the electric? Um, based on their square foot, you know, if you have the bill and it's a hundred dollars, but you're only using one third of that building space, do they pay one third of the electric? And the, those 
utility costs can be built into the monthly lease rate. Built into the they can lease. Be built, correct. Based on square footage, based on, on use, you, you can't just go by square footage. Again, it's going to depend if they're just in an office, there's nothing in the office except for two people, and you have another office with the same square footage, but they bring in tons of equipment that run all day long. So there's, uh, there's ways we could do that. We would have to figure out the fair way to break that down. Based would upon you look at also is. possibly including like if there's a conference center that they use or, or um, I don't know, a Wi-Fi that's used in the building as opposed to just their own, um, would that be looked at too? Uh, I know that the conference centers can be reserved individually now. So they're already but sharing do, conference centers. Do they pay to use that conference center? No, if they are in as a tenant, they are able to uh, secure the, the conference room. And by, hey, I need to rent it on Monday at two o'clock kind of thing, they, they coordinate that with They you? coordinate that through the office. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, Oh, I have plenty. Oh, uh, Awaken Church. My notes show that their lease is up in like 30 days, 60 days, something like that. Um, and that we're supposed to have that conversation about what we're doing with them because based on my calculations, they're paying $2.50 a square foot. Correct. They're paying $200 for each um unit for each suite that they rent, and right. they have two suites. Mm -hmm. So the CEC is a little bit different than the Family Service Center, as you all are aware. Um, the CEC holds three individual sites, um, and then the Family Service Center has, has right now, I believe we have eight agencies for this. So um, they are only paying $200 per site. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all for trying to get some Fairness, um, especially when I see the retail. Now, when you're talking about the area rental space, are you looking to increase to match more of what is area wide, or are you looking to keep it at a reduced rate? Uh, I, I think if it's a nonprofit, that that's a discussion that we're going to have when we put the policy together, we're, we're going to show what the surrounding rates are. We're gonna present that. Uh, it will be at the discretion of the board, whether or not you wanna make changes to that for nonprofits or someone you think brings benefit to the residents of the city. Excellent. Um, Mayor, I believe at this time, that's all the questions I have. Um, look forward to discussion. It may raise other questions. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Langdon. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, does anyone remember when when we first set our lease rates, um, how were they originally determined? So I, I could not answer that. Yeah. Okay. I, I flip a coin. I know that they're kind of, they, they yeah, were they all were, over the place in our research. They were all over. So it just sort of a patchwork quilt as it was new it was controlled by on. different departments and different people within those Got departments it. and that's that's kind of why we're trying to centralize this. Okay. I think I heard the answer to this, but I want to make sure. So are we able to track utility usage by unit in any of the buildings? Or is there some, like one electric bill for everybody? There may be some of the smaller off site buildings that have uh, separate electric running to them and I would have to check to see how many meters when you get into a building like the family service center it's just not feasible to put a meter for every right. for every one of those suites okay the suites so it's may one change. yeah it's one bill for the whole building okay was was there any common objective in thinking I understand a lot of this was set a long time ago in different departments but overall, is our intention to give the nonprofits a break? I mean, when I look at the monthly rents, hugely below what is market. So I have to believe that at some point there was an intention with all of these agreements to give nonprofits good space at a very reduced rate. Would that be fair? Again, that was, uh, I'm, prob I'm certain that was done at the discretion of the board and it would move forward in that direction as well. 
Okay. And I, I want to confirm that I think I heard the answer to this one as well. What was the intention of requiring a certain number of hours? And I think Commissioner McDowell kind of touched on that. Is, is there are places that want to say that they provide services in Northport just so they broaden their scope? Uh, doesn't necessarily be that mean that they're going to be in Northport. Mm -hmm. They may show up one day a week. So to, for us to best benefit the residents, we tried, and I would think the intention was to try to force them to be here and provide those services that they've promised for that reduced rate. I mean, I, I, th I think that could be pretty black and white when you have someone in that. I'm making a comment. I apologize. But if you have someone in that space not utilizing it, we're keeping someone else out. So I'm totally cool with an intention. If, if we don't physically see you here a minimum number of hours, you're out. Go find other space. We have people who want to come in. Okay. Yeah, I, th I thought I heard that. Um, should we or do we rate our buildings by age and condition? I mean, certainly the social services building has a lot of amenities that some of the other buildings do not have. So are you thinking that we might set a certain price per square foot individually building to building? I, I believe there will be leadway for that. It will be, it will, we will have to address that because there are certain facilities that, as you said, offer much more, uh, are in much newer condition. So we would certainly look at that. That will be part of our, our policy and what we present as uh, kind of a lease schedule. Of okay. Um, are you thinking that there might be a different rate based upon the type of usage? So if someone has an office versus using space as storage, would you sort of see a different way of costing out uh, use usage type or something like that right we're looking at it from a square footage standpoint if you're sitting in x amount of square feet in this building if we're getting that much mission has said this is what we get for that unless you direct us otherwise um, and and that's in an effort to keep things fair right right we would we would prefer to have people in there that we're serving the residents rather than lease it to someone that's just using it for storage Okay, I think that's it for now. I yield the floor. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, so basically, Mr. Speaks, what you're looking for here is our go ahead to go ahead. So you guys are going to go out and do the work and prepare and come up with the corresponding numbers according to what's valued in the neighboring areas and stuff. And you're going to bring us back a policy that we will discuss and then put our little tweaks and you know on it so basically is that what you're looking for today yes sir and we're, we're not really looking for anything we're presenting the information that was requested uh and along with that the city manager's office has has tasked us with uh coming up with the policy so we're just kind of giving you an update of what you are going to see in the future right and and that's fine because rather than getting in a long drawn out conversation about this needs to be this this needs to be this that's exactly what you're working on right now Yes, sir. So, and then that will come back. So. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. Do we have anybody else that wishes to speak? We have one here. I'm waiting. All right. Okay. I, thank Commissioner you very Luke, much. I'm thank just you. making sure you came in first, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm the one that ignited this conversation back in 2018. Uh, I had requested to see, because at that point in time, the family service building was charging 14 or 1450 mm -hmm. a square foot. Mm -hmm. And so I asked for a breakdown to see why we were charging our nonprofits that much money. Uh, Mr. Speaks report that. came back showing it was only, I'm gonna approximate it, $5 and 25 cents square foot is what the maintenance was came before the board back then. The board did not want, I was suggesting leaving it at $2 higher, you know, a 725 and the board did not. They wanted to grab what they could. 
and they settled on 950 a square foot. Not that 950 a square foot was justified, <laughs> not anything of the sort, it's just that they could, they could get it. Uh, so that is for the history of the two new commissioners. That is the history of where we got to. Uh, I appreciate uh, the city manager's direct directive to look this over with a policy that will be for all. Uh, hopefully there is a difference in the terminology of nonprofit versus governmental entities. Those are different types of leases. So this policy is gonna to have to take in a lot. Uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Doesn't really always happen when you have an older building that um, doesn't match up to the same cost as a different building with more amenities. There definitely would have to be a, a viewpoint of what the uh, entity is doing to provide to the city. When an entity is providing food to our community in a time of need, that is totally different than a lot of others, I'll just put it that way, of, of what they might be doing. So there has to be a scale or a rating, I would believe, in what is being provided and how often it's being provided to the citizens also. Uh, back then, we did make the decision of that 32 hours because we had some nonprofits that were not in but twice a week and people would call needing help and the entities were not there. So we said at least you had to be there 32 hours. If you did not do that, guess what? Your space was surrendered and the next person or next organization who needed facility could occupy that. So that's kind of a history of it, but I do appreciate um, this next step, which is far larger than what it appeared it was going to be. But I like this step mm -hmm. because it is gonna to equate to something that is fair and just all around, not some blanket. And it's gonna be looking at true costs and not just, oops, let's charge everybody the highest price that we're charging over here. That's not right. I cannot be a part of anything like that. So uh, to staff looking into this and the oversight of city manager, thank you. Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, Mayor, um, I appreciate this conversation. Um, I, I may have philosophical differences than my fellow board members and that's okay. Um, the reason we went to this flat rate instead of being all over the board um, way back 16 or 17. Um, and Commissioner Luke is correct. We did go up to the 450, I think it was a square foot. And that was high. And I appreciated her bringing that back and saying we need to lower it. The 950 was also supposed to help with the costs of maintenance of that building for when it needs a new AC unit or a new roof. Those, those costs of maintenance were already factored in. That's my recollection. Um, I, I don't know how anyone can, can quantify that nonprofit A is more valuable than nonprofit B. They, they each provide a service to the community and really and truly those, those, those users of that nonprofit will say, oh no, that nonprofit is far better than B or that nonprofit is far better than A because that's what they use. Each, each one of those units has a different user to it. And I don't know how the city can possibly pick and choose which one of those gets, hey, you do this, you're going to get a lesser rate. Um, each one of them brings a value to our city. And to quantify that is going to be extremely difficult for me. I uh, look forward to figuring out how y'all are going to do that. Um, 
I like the idea that these leases are going to be as consistent as possible. Um, we have plenty of nonprofits in this city, plenty of them. And looking at today's market rate of like $14 a square foot, there's a lot of them that would probably just say, hey, if we didn't have that 32 hours, hey, we could go down to Northport and pay $9 or $9.50 and just put storage in there. It's far cheaper. We want them to serve the citizens of Northport. We want them here helping our citizens one-on-one -on -one or in small groups or however they do their business. Um, not to just say, oh, we got space down in Northport, but we don't do anything for them. That was what was really the precipice of requiring that 32 hours. Um, public benefit, unquantifiable. I, I, every single one of those nonprofits provides something to our city. And there are plenty of nonprofits out there that do not rent space from the city, that do not have any, any um, tangible interest in what the city does or the city with them. Um, I, I like the idea of the website, but I, I also have to kind of wonder, are we advertising for them? Or are we just saying, hey, citizens, this, this nonprofit is here and this is kind of a summary of what they do. That would be more what I'm looking for. Um, advertising for nonprofits, they know how to do that all on their own. <laughs> yeah, and the website's just going to be advertising our policy. More oh, so than, than okay, the so actual... it's just the policy, nothing Correct. else. Well, that's that's a given. That's always on our website. All of the other policies. Well, if seem someone to be... decides if there's a nonprofit somewhere else that wants to decides they want a presence here, they can easily go to the website nice. and kind of see what we have available nice. and, and what our requirements are. Um, I think you guys have your work cut out for you, um, and I look forward to seeing what you bring back. That that quantifying who's better or worse than the other one. That's a very uh, difficult way to do things, and I don't think that's fair. I think it's sending a very mixed message to our, our nonprofits. So good luck with that one. <laughs> Vice Mayor sure London. I'm not sure that's what we said, picking and choosing which one is better or We're not. That's what's kind of happened in the past, uh, I think. Yeah, what we're, we're trying we're doing not to do. That. Well, well, let's let's chat about that because it says here the public benefit use of the space criteria and qualified organizations criteria. As, so, as you just said, if there is a nonprofit who is leasing our space but not providing the public benefit to our community, because we recognize that they are not there, then they could, in this example, rate lower than someone who is there twenty four seven and providing a tangible product and list to our residents. Now, that's not to say that's exactly how that measurement will be in the policy, but when we talk about public benefit, overall, ideally, if they're all providing the same level of service within our community, the only true thing we need to ensure is that the benefit they're providing is in alignment with our values and our strategic planning process, which should not be hard to do for most nonprofits. Vice Mayor Langdon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I really appreciate all the work that went into this data. I, I couldn't even deal with the spreadsheet, you know, by the I time know. I was on the third page of the horizontal. I don't know if that was by design or just <laughs> it got away from you or what, but I can't imagine the level of effort that went into that. And I would suggest that rather than trying to recreate what would what sounds like a somewhat chaotic past, I would suggest it would be really interesting to me, and maybe our real estate coordinator can do this, for each of our buildings establish what would the market rate be? And then what is our intention? I think I've heard we want to give nonprofits good space at a very good deal. So by building, let's say, and I'm making this up, $20 a square foot is the market rate for the social services building. And, and we want to give nonprofits in that building a 50% break or whatever, and everybody gets that break. Um, 
And, and so I guess what I'm suggesting is, is rather than trying to figure out the past to either change it or build on it, let's just cut it and move forward <laughs> and sort of establish that market rate and then determine what kind of a discount do we want to give to our nonprofits. And having been in several of the buildings, I know the market rate's gonna be different <laughs> for different buildings. I would also suggest that we have some kind of a um, different way of assessing what's being used as office space, space where people are gonna be in working versus what is being utilized for storage space. Um, storage, in, in my mind, would be a lower rate than a rate where people are, are going to be walking, uh, working, but I'd, I'd look for you to come back with that. Um, my advice would also be, let's steer clear of qualitative assessments. We're landlords at the end of the day, and so I would be highly resistant to wanting to monitor any metrics or number of people served or any of that. We're landlords, and, it, and if we have certain criteria, you pay your rent on time, you're there for at least a certain number of days or a certain number of hours of days that can be applied to everybody, I'm cool with that. Um, and then I think we need to decide, are we landlords or are we running a program of some type? I, I kind of responded really well to Ms. Carrillo's uh, statement that in the social services building anyway, we're really trying to create a one-stop shop. So I wouldn't be opposed to our having a list of the kinds of services we wanna see in that building. And if an agency of a certain type leaves and, and we want a veterans affairs, I'm making this up, in, in that space, then we look for another veterans affairs kind of. So I, I wouldn't be at all opposed to that. I think that makes a whole lot of sense, but then we need to be really fair and blind <laughs> to you know, who comes in there. Um, and, and that would be my advice. Again, I, my gut tells me getting into any kind of qualitative evaluation of who should be there or not just doesn't settle well with me. Any requirements that we put into place need to be pretty binary. They're doing it, they're not doing it. <laughs> and everyone's treated the same when they do it or when they don't do it. So simple, clean, um, fair is, is my final comment. Thanks. Thank you, Vice President. Commissioner White. Yes, um, I, I do uh, appreciate this being here in the city, having this building available for services, because I do remember a time when we had to go outside of Northport for everything. I mean, Venice or even Charlotte County to go for counseling or any, any services. And I remember, in fact, the police department received a grant for a van to transport, I think it was women, to Venice for counseling, because we had nothing here. And, and they couldn't get to, to Venice because that was it. That was your only option. So I really appreciate the fact that we have this center available for these nonprofits, but I feel strongly that they, they need to be providing the services that they say they are and not just because to say we serve Northport, so yes, they can get the grant money because if they serve more areas, they, they qualify better. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, can we... Uh, can we solicit for certain agencies to be in here like Social Security? Is that something we can do or no? Because I've had phone calls from people about not being able, they have to go to Venice for the, that's the closest Social Security office, right? But they have to go there. And can we get one or is that just that's a government thing? Like they decide where they want to set up. I believe that's a government thing and they pick their locations according to probably population. Well, we have a big We're the largest. Know. Yes, yeah. but I'm just saying that's how they choose. So we may be next on their radar saying we need to be down there. But they would create but we, their we would own, initiate that conversation. They would create their own complex and everything in buildings. 
Well, the one in Venice is in a shopping center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ms. Commissioner McCallum knows what I'm talking about because I've yeah, had a couple people. Yeah, that this so is where we have to go. The counties. Yeah, and they say, well, how come there isn't one in Northport? And I had no answer for them. So can we, is that something we can pursue? Like, okay, how about opening up a, an office in, in Northport to serve people? I, um, I don't know just, the mechanism for that. I'm, no, I'm just throwing it out there. My world. That I'd, I'd like that for that to be on our radar. Yeah, okay. Like sending a letter to the Postal Service. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, being in it, that it's in the shopping center, they're renting that space from the shopping center right. owner providing a government service. So it could be the same here if there was often open well, space. I'm just wondering if everyone has, has ever, you know, instigated that, that conversation, initiated that conversation. And that maybe that's why. They're, they're very happy where they are because we've never asked. I'm just wondering who would be the one to ask for that. Can I make pick up the phone and call? <laughs> pick up the phone and call, sure. Any <laughs> citizen can. Okay. All right. Sounds like a new agenda item. <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, yes, thank you very much. I know you guys know what you're doing going forward, and I think you got a pretty good strategy going on, and you know exactly what's coming from the board here. Um, do we have any public comment? We do not. Okay, and I don't have any in-house. I'll request a motion. I don't believe I don't believe we need a motion. Well, the motion that's on, on here is exactly what. What, what exactly allows them to go and do what they need to do? Well, he stated this was just a report this that was, he wasn't yeah. looking for anything from us. Remember, these sheets are made up from the clerk's office, <laughs> and they're always right. <laughs> okay. Man, if you I, don't, go ahead. Let's just double check, City Manager. Do you need any formal direction from us to proceed? Uh, no, ma'am. What we need is when we bring the information back to you, a decision on the policy that's been proposed, so you to edit and then approve it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Unless anybody, it's been an hour and a half. Does anybody need a potty break or anything, or can we get through this one? No, sir. All right. Uh, item number 22-2042, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Um, this item uh, is for us to create a maintenance and renovation account for our facility and building maintenance. I believe that this was upon the direction of city commission for us to bring this back. So we have brought it back. I do believe there's not a present. <laughs> Sorry. Audio, uh, sir. My apologies. <laughs> so this item is for us to create a building and maintenance uh, renovation account. We are bringing it back for your consideration based on the direction that we were given from city commission. I do not believe there's a presentation. There is. They do have a brief presentation, and our interim public works director, Chuck Speak, will um, be here to discuss the item. So this was discussed back in the budget workshops, mm -hmm. if you remember. Uh, the commission had a consensus for us to bring back an agenda item related to this topic. And in the following budget meeting, uh, you awarded us monies to start this program. So what we've done, rather than talk about some of the reasons that we, we needed that initial fund, uh, is kind of put something together. And what we'd like to do is we would like to get to a point where we look at our buildings and our, our major components of our buildings like we do with our vehicles. They really are no different. Uh, the building itself, itself stays, but it needs maintenance. The components need replacement. So. What we would like to do is build an R&R &R account for facilities. Um, and I'm going to go through this brief presentation, and then and we can kind of dig into that a little more uh, if you have any questions. So as an overview, um, what we want to do, we've, we've got numerous, you know, 70 plus city buildings in different shapes and sizes. We, we have everything from standalone restrooms in the parks to the city hall complex, all have 
different needs all have maintenance costs, absolutely. Um, what we would like to do as, as Facilities Maintenance Department of Public Works is we would like to build out a 10-year plan, okay, which would include a comprehensive assessment of every building envelope and every major component within that building. What that will tell us is what the lifespan is of your, your major components. It will also tell us the frequency uh, of our building envelope all the way down to carpet replacement. When should we be doing that to get the best uh, service out of the component, whatever that may be. So if we develop that 10 year plan, that's gonna show us where we need to be, how much money we need to be putting aside. So we don't come in here and say, you know, during budget time, we need $500,000 because we need to re-roof two buildings. We would prefer to have that money slowly put away, plan for that, and then there's no, no ups and downs in that facility budget. Facility is always a tough budget. It's general fund, and, and I can tell you that we struggle every year to get things done. We always defer maintenance, uh, and, and the commissioners that have been here and have sat with me through those budget workshops, I always tell you, if it comes out this year, it comes back next, that need does not go away. So I really think an R&R account for, for these facilities is the direction we need to go. Uh, and we'll keep moving through this. So, okay. So we maintain 75 buildings and facilities. That's about 342,000 square feet. The estimated total replacement cost of the city buildings as of 2021 was $78 million. Uh, we provide the predictive, preventative, and emergency maintenance through contractors and city staff. Uh, preventative maintenance types, you're looking at waterproofing, painting, and minor repairs of facilities. Predictive or proactive maintenance, doing things such as replacement of air handling units, um, scheduled roof replacements, and building envelope maintenance. Um, the building envelope is really an important thing. People don't think about that. That keeps your building dry, keeps all the outside forces from getting inside. Once you, there's no reason to do anything inside a building if the envelope isn't secure, okay? Anything you do inside without a secure envelope has the potential of being uh, damaged by outside forces. And reactive or emergency maintenance is when we have to react to a HVAC system that goes down or we develop a roof leak and we have to react to that. So contractors perform about 90% of fencing, roofing, those type of, of projects for us, 70% of our mechanical system repairs, and city staff perform 70 to 80% of other trades work, meaning minor electrical, carp, carpentry, and plumbing. Why do we need a 10-year maintenance plan? It will eliminate deferred maintenance, which we've kind of touched that already. It will provide a process for planned expenditures, keep that up and down in our budget cycle. It will protect the city investment and it will reduce reactive and emergency repairs, which are more costly. So an emergency repair versus a proactive maintenance for a 10,000 square foot building, the cost to replace a roof is about $25 a square foot, about 250,000. Cost to resurface about $5 a square foot. It'll add 10 to 15 years. Uh, the cost of a roof failure, okay, that emergency repair, that's about $125 a square foot. And that, that can go higher. It depends on how bad the failure is and what, what components are damaged underneath. So we want to maintain, we want to replace prior to failure, and we will save money. So we want to anticipate the reduction, or we anticipate the reduction of emergency repairs and replacement if we can get a fund and a plan in place where we can proactively have a schedule, do scheduled maintenance on our major components. Uh, we will have less of those emergency repairs. It will provide a safe environment for citizens and staff. We'll reduce energy use of equipment and buildings. If your equipment is maintained properly, it uses less energy. That's just a fact. And we'll eliminate big surprises and interruptions to building operations. 
So one of the steps is the facilities maintenance assessment, and that's to develop a 10-year plan. So it's going to include all existing city buildings. It will be a complete facilities inventory. We'll establish life expectancy and inventory components, develop lists of major maintenance and repairs needs, establish timeline for maintenance projects, and develop a final report, plan, and budgetary estimates. Okay. So this is going to include all the city maintained build buildings and facilities. We're going to, again, inventory all those assets. We're going to have a listing of all the major maintenance, repair, and renewal, renewal projects greater than 5,000. And we'll list the summary of projected costs for each fiscal year through 3233. So as funding options for this plan, and again, we're recommending a 10-year facilities maintenance plan. We want to see out in the future. These are big costs when we, we come down to these buildings. Uh, the first option is to continue providing funds to, to address deferred maintenance, which is what we started last year. That $200,000 is helping us get things done that we've deferred in previous years. Uh, combined with identified annual funds to meet facility predictive maintenance needs based on that assessment report. And operate, or option two is to increase our operating budget annually for facilities, for facilities maintenance plan over the next 10 years to meet the identified annual funding needs based on the facilities maintenance assessment report. Um, and this would be that R&R, where we want to put that money in. We want to see what it's going to take. Uh, our intent with that 10-year plan is once we build that out, we'll have those component lifespans. Those will then, as we get to that five-year mark, as we replace new equipment, we know what the average lifespan is based on this report. We can project that out. We know a year before that piece of equipment should be replaced that we need to start looking. You know, we can plan for that replacement. The R&R account will give us that funding available to, to do those big projects. So we, we request that the city commission approve the concept of the 10-year facilities maintenance plan beginning in 22-23 and kind of provide us some feedback on the options uh, for funding because it all comes down to the funding for this project. And we are prepared to answer any questions. Um, Commissioner Lou. Thank you, sir. Uh, I really only have one question that came to my mind uh, as you were going through this because I definitely believe in this as we discussed during the budget. Uh, and I like the round of 10 year, but as you go through those 75 buildings and when you budget then in that 10 year cycle, is all the maintenance that you figure for each of those 75 items going to be totaled within the 10 year time. Reason, reason I'm asking, I mean, like fire department puts away a certain amount to buy the fire truck in 10 years. Uh, so if you put away all the monies needed to paint, replace carpet, whatever, there are some items that are going to last 20 years, such as a roof. Uh, you may need to touch something up or whatever, but the full amount isn't needed for some items for 20 years. How are you going to calculate that within the 10-year program? So the 10-year plan is to get us from, from now to 10 years out. There are going to be many, many components within our facilities that, that aren't touched in the next 10 years. Our chillers, they're going to be replaced this year. So they're not going to show up in that 10-year plan. They're more of a 15-year lifespan. As part of this assessment, they're going to assess all of our equipment and envelopes. So they're going to tell us if it's a 15-year, if it's a 20-year. The 10-year plan is basically to fund the needs that are identified in the first 10 years. But then we're going to have the life expectancy of all the components. And we will program those further out. So if it's 15 years out for the chillers, we'll know 
what that, you know, that 15 year mark is when we need to replace the chillers. It's not the 10 year plan. Don't think of it as everything has to be done in the 10 year and all the money is, is right now. That's just the immediate needs for the next 10 years that we need to think about. Okay. Now I'm thinking in the other direction too, 15 years for a chiller or whatever. Do you put that in the 10 year plan at the five year mark of that life expectancy? I think you factor in a small portion of that cost throughout from the inception of this plan. That's what the R&R fund's for. You start putting that money in now, anything that doesn't get spent this year gets rolled into the next. And that those funds build up, just like our equipment. They will build up in that account to be there for when, when we need those. And that, that can be a number that the commission you know, we're going to bring back and say, here's what's recommended for these first 10 years. And, and you may say, we can't put that much money away every year for the next 10 years. And, and that's a discussion when we see what those numbers are going to be. Uh, but we have to start somewhere. Definitely. So basically, the life expectancy will be placed on the facility, building, whatever, then it will be calculated as to how often it would be needed or necessary. And then a certain portion of that total cost would be figured into the plan right from the get-go. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Thank you, sir. Vice Mayor Langdon. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, and I think some of the backup material might have derailed me a little bit in my thinking. But are we focused, well, let me say, state it differently. We're focused really on physical plant building. We're not talking about grounds maintenance or park equipment or we're really talking about our buildings, correct? This is building and supporting components. So... When you I say define that, supporting, com I think I know what a building is. What's a sure. supporting component? Any of the mechanical systems that operate a building, okay. uh, as well as your parking lots. People tend to forget mm -hmm. that <laughs> you need, you, your parking lot's pretty important. Right. That's, that's right. part of facilities maintenance. Uh, we do landscaping, that sort of thing, but that's not what we're looking for in this. That's, that's more of... Uh, Everyday maintenance, we can't predict when a tree is going to die or when we need to, to resod an area. So that's that's what your your everyday facilities maintenance funds are for, your operational funds. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're trying to do is capture those large items that cause a swing in that that budget for okay. facilities maintenance. So in, in the parks budget, for example, we replace gym equipment in our parks on an annual basis for a quarter of a million a pop. I'm assuming that's outside of what you're talking about. Correct. And we, terrific. As far as facilities and what we, you don't need that gym equipment for that facility to operate. So those right. fall to the departments. Good, 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 good. Um, I just might suggest a rolling 10 year. <laughs> that might be sort of a good way to keep a 10 year window going since you're going to you're going to be looking at the next 10 years and the next 10 years on an ongoing basis. So just that, a suggestion. That will, be, that will be the intent. We we yeah. have in our work management system our asset management system um, we track all of the the facilities and that's another thing that this is going to help it's going to identify some that we may not have captured yet. Yeah. Uh, within that system we have the ability to put in you know, life cycle. We track all the maintenance on it. So we right. can put in life cycle. So all those things will tell us as we get close. So it's not going to be that, you know, Chuck or Garrett aren't here anymore in 15 years and nobody knows when that one's supposed to be done. This is right. all going to be in our system. Right. And it will carry through. Right. And then just a quick question on your funding plans. Option one, um, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely on board with you in terms of that 10-year window, mm -hmm. but we're just starting this, and there are bound to be some things breaking down early in this 10-year cycle. So I'm not sure how we avoid some elements of option one <laughs> as we get rolling. So how how should we account for that or plan for that? 
And I think, uh, as we did last year with that 200,000 was a great start for us. Mm -hmm. it, it's really, it's, it's helping greatly. I think we continue that. Yep. Um, uh, we, we really intended to have this, this assessment, this 10 year assessment and plan completed before we had our budget workshops. We're having a little trouble with some engineering firms and everybody's so busy right now to, right. to get somebody to help us with some of the assessments. So um, we're going to do our best to get those numbers to present present those yeah. so we can see what it looks like and, and the best way to move forward. But funding that, as we did last time with that 200 to work on that deferred, um, that will take a lot of the pressure off of our normal operating budget where in most cases we have to pull from normal operating to handle some of those unexpected things. Right. Right. So maybe in the short term, we still might do a little bit of that, but the yeah. intention is to be planful and Correct. anticipate when these things will happen. And understanding that we're, we understand that we're not going to be able to drop enough in, in the first couple of years to cover everything mm -hmm. that might come up. Right. We hope that the assessment shows and gives us some leeway with some of the improvements that we've been making. Um, but we won't know that until we get the assessment back. I just want to, I'm delighted by, by this. I think we really need to be good stewards of our physical plant and we have to be prepared for things. So thank you so much for this work. This is great. Thank you. Vice Thanks. Commissioner McDowell. So when you say that you want to do an assessment uh, and get an assessment report, showing the age of the roof, the age of the AC, and all that other kind of stuff. I could have swore the commission already authorized some kind of an assessment like what you were talking about to be completed. Are you saying that has not been done, or is it in the process, or is it already completed? It is in process. Okay. So we've started on roofs as far as assessment. It's not just age. Age is easy. Right. look at the age of something. Uh, no, it's, but it's not, because if you replaced an air conditioner, I'm not talking the age of the building, I'm talking about the age of that piece of equipment. And, right. Okay. Yeah, and again, the assessment has to be, it can't be based just on how many years of things in service. And that's why you need someone to assess it where it sits. Uh, our chiller system here is, is old, and that's why it's failing. It doesn't have some outside components affecting it say a chiller plant in venice and i know about that one by their city hall the salt water ate it to pieces so a lot of it depends on how close you are to you know and the environmental impacts it may have where you are so that's why it would be real easy to say okay every air conditioner needs to be replaced every x amount of years or every roof needs to be replaced it depends on which way the building's facing there's there's a lot of different things that go into those assessments how many leaves get into the <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> Okay, there's, so, there's so that assessment is currently being completed. Any idea when it will be? Well, and that's what that that's one of the things that we're having trouble with with the engineering firms okay. being being backed up right now. All right, um, the and I appreciate Commissioner Luke and Lane, uh, Vice Mayor Langdon mentioning about the ten year that sometimes some things aren't ten years. Sometimes it's fifteen or twenty. Um, and I appreciate that conversation, so we won't reiterate it. Um, my other question is, are the, so you mentioned that this is a general fund. Facilities is in the general fund. So right. when we are creating an R&R or R&M, whatever it's gonna be called, account, will the districts be paying for their buildings, maintenance, and R&R. For example, the fire department paying for their fire stations, the public works paying for those buildings for public works, parks paying their portion of the parks buildings. How, or is that all in the, is that information going to come back as to what it looks like when we have budget discussion? So the, the districts would pay their share they would have to pay their share. Uh, parks is general fund. Okay. So that will just come out of that general fund portion. Fire is split, uh, general fund and fire, correct. Public works is split in several directions, but we have that, that split broken down. Um, when we get those costs back, those buildings will be identified. The, the plan is to have the uh, assessment done and broken down by fund. Okay. So we'll be able to say this, you know, 
here's your fire district, here's the funds that that, that comes out of. Uh, public works, you've got road and drainage, solid waste, you know, and general fund for facilities. So we intend to break that down and we'll have to work with finance to see the best way to capture the funds to put them into that r, &R account. But it's just like, it's, it's no different than they do for the vehicles. It's, it's the same setup. Yeah, and it'll be interesting. Are you going to, with this assessment, put in a column of useful life as to how many years useful life and where we are in that useful life? Are you going to be using that same kind of thing like you do for the fleet? We can certainly build out a score sheet that will show. I mean, it's it's we track all of the maintenance already in our, mm -hmm. in our work management system. Uh, so we could easily show that. It's a little different with with buildings and components, um, but we can certainly make a score sheet. It's just we don't touch them as much as we do vehicles, so it wouldn't have probably as much information. Okay. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing what y'all come up with. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, I got a quick question on Commissioner White. My understanding on this account, and tell me if I'm wrong, is this is going to be a separate account for like major overhauls down the road. Your regular budget from year to year is still gonna be working on regular maintenance on the buildings, correct? Correct. This is in case something major happens like the chillers go out or we need a roof or we, we make that we know that it's going to happen in five to seven years. This is a separate account to take care of those big purchases because if you start putting money into this account each year, you're just going to dwindle it away as you go. How are you going to stack up those funds? So I just want to make sure that that's what you're talking about because, you know, the painting and the carpets and this, that, and the other could be a yearly expense and not something major unless you're doing all of City Hall in one year, you know, on carpets. That could be quite a bit of money. But is, isn't that the true intent for this? It is for the major components of the, the facility. Yeah, because this way you would be able to put monies away each year to achieve that goal. Because if you're taking it each year, you're just spinning your wheels. Correct. We'll still maintain an operating budget. Uh, we just won't take, you know, the intent is to not to take those big purchases out of that budget. That may, uh, in the end, as we move forward and we start building that R&R &R account, that may allow us to reduce that operating budget because right now we pull a lot of these funds when these things happen out of that budget, uh, but that we'll have to see when the time comes. Right, and, and, and I agree with that. When we're steady, right. then, then you can pick and choose, but if we're trying to start building this, I don't want to defeat ourselves every single year moving forward. Yes, That's, that was my only concern, so Commissioner White? Yeah, I just, I had a, a question about option one versus option two. Is there, is there another way? Can, can you just explain that in a nutshell? Like what? Sure. And, and the options are. Very, they seem are, to be very similar to me. I don't understand what the difference. Then go so, for three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so option one kind of, kind of provides those deferred maintenance funds that you guys provided to facilities maintenance last year. So that $200,000 is for that deferred maintenance, all those little things that we pushed off. And I know we think, you know, we can get caught in thinking, oh, well, we have to paint a building and that's not much, but, mm. you know, painting a fire station can be $50,000. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so those deferred funds would allow us to keep moving forward with catching up, I should say, uh, with what we've kind of pushed off and what we have as immediate needs while we're building that fund, that R and R fund. If not, you're going to roll your deferred maintenance into the R and R. And as the mayor said, you're going to chip away at it mm -hmm. before you even get to build up. So um, we would like to take care of those deferred maintenance issues um, and build that fund at the same time. So is that what option one would do? That is that is what option one. Option two spreads those costs out over that 10-year period. So you're going to be doing deferred costs, deferred maintenance, and your normal maintenance out of the, or, or your anticipated maintenance out of the same monies. And I would prefer to keep that R&R &R fund just for 
what we see in that 10 year plan. They're not looking backwards so much in this plan. I mean, they're going to see things, but remember we have requests and, and just to throw them out there, we, you know, city hall is going to have to be painted in not too distant future. It's a big building. It's a lot of money. Carpeting, as the mayor said, on a building like this or a building as big as PD, it's, a, it's, it's a large amount of money. So we've been deferring a lot of those small little maintenance issues because, you know, it sounds like, why, why do we want to spend $30,000 putting carpet down? Well, eventually you have to, you end up with trip hazards, you end up with issues in the carpet mold, you know, employees can't, can't work in their workspace. So we would like to do the deferred. And then, you know, as we build that R and R fund, as we catch up, that deferred can drop off of course. And we work out of the R and R fund. Okay. All right. Thanks. Comments. Follow-up question. Pardon me. May I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So, based on what you just said, that in the beginning you'll be doing deferred, and then eventually that'll disappear, and you'll go to just the R and R as time goes on. So, wouldn't that really be like an option three? Yes, it's it's kind of an option three. Okay. I mean, we we we're looking for an R and R, right? And, and that's an increase in our budget in our facilities budget, that you would have to increase the facilities budget to put money into that account from whichever, as many account streams as we had that were related to the work that needed to be done. So is it fair to say that for like the next five years, you'll have a deferral where you have to do these maintenance things and at the same time, having that R&R &R account to plan when we 10 years from now when we have to redo what we just did this year. That's the goal, correct? That is that is the goal. Okay, so it is really an option three of, of doing deferred and R&R &R because we have to get caught up. We're behind the eight ball. We have to clear that eight ball and then move forward. Correct. As well as our operating. I mean, your operating budget's going to have to be there for minor maintenance Man, I, always. I, this sounds like it's going to be a very hefty price tag. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see those numbers. Uh, Thank we've, you. Got, we've got $78 million worth of buildings. And to, to not take care of those. It's, it's silly right. not to take care of them. Right. OK. Anybody else wish to give comments? Put not your names a, on the board. Not a, not a comment, <laughs> but. Uh, Hold on. No names come up yet. Sitting on mine. There we go. Oh, Vice Mayor Landon. <laughs> oh. Vice Mayor Landon okay. came in it first. It did. It popped in. Um, just, just a, a one quick comment, and this might be more for City Manager than for you, Mr. Speak. Um, when we start taking our budget out to the community, as I'm sure you're going to want to do later this year, we're going to have to be really careful around our messaging around what I might call these retention funds. Um, often people in the community don't understand the value of that and they start getting concerned that we're over taxing. We kind of saw that come up in the fire budget um, this past budget cycle. So we're really just gonna have to be very prepared in terms of how we present that and how we talk about it and answer questions around it. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Luke. I'm thinking toward a motion. <laughs> I'm thinking toward a motion too, but I, like I put it out there for comments. You're the last one here, yeah. so. But I mean, it looks as though we're supposed to be choosing from option one or option two, but actually we're wanting to do a blend, if I'm mm -hmm. hearing you correct, sir. Can I clear that up? Just please, touch. please. Just, just because option one, it, it doesn't say R and R in there. That's that's that's, right. that's the confusion. So the deferred maintenance funds in option one combined with the identified annual funds to meet the facility predictive maintenance needs. So the predictive maintenance needs are going to come from the assessment. And then those those are the annual funds that we want to go into that R and R. So we we neglected to put the R and R in that option one, but that's, so that's where we are. Option yes. three. So they're both kind of are they're, they're both related to the R and R fund. The one provides the deferred maintenance monies. The one does not. 
So one, All right. so one does, two does not. Option one that is talking about the 10-year plan also because is that what you're calling the R&R? &R? The R&R &R fund is just where plan? that money is going to sit that we're going to use in that 10-year plan. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And I apologize no. for not having that in there. But let me let me ask one question. I mean, I know you're trying to establish the R and R account today, but wouldn't it be better if we establish that today and figure out the budgetary issues at budget time on where the money's coming and going? Absolutely, that's our intent. Today, we would just like to hear that you guys are in support of an R and R fund for facilities maintenance. When we get that assessment, we'll bring back those numbers and and how you decide to work through those numbers with us will happen during budget time. Because I, I'd rather handcuff something today because numbers could fluctuate between now and when we talk about this at budget. There may be a lot more money or a lot less money. I'm trying to be positive going forward to where we could, at that point, put that into the R&R &R account. Absolutely. We're not looking for any monies to be allocated yeah. today. Yeah. We're just looking for the direction that we would like to go. Do we want to go R and R fund with a deferred? Do we want to go without? Because what will happen when we come back to budget if we go without the, the deferred maintenance? Those R and R monies will be elevated. The funds that we need to get through the next couple of years are going to be elevated because that deferred compensation is going to have to be spread out over those probably the first five years to get caught up. Right. Okay. Just okay. as long as my motion Not makers know numbers. what they're looking for. Yes. Yes, sir. That's good. Follow up question. Yes. So if you get your assessment and you're wanting to incorporate this in the budget, if we don't see this prior to budget, how are we going to be able to tell you, yes, proceed, this is great, we like your numbers, or go, holy mackerel, we need to adjust. <laughs> so how does that work? So our intent, as I said, was to get it put together before workshops. Uh, if we together for us or together for you to present at workshops for us to present to you or and, and we can try to get that to you ahead of this. as soon as we get the assessment you guys are we're going to provide that to the city manager's office he's going to provide that to commission i'm sure uh, if we are unable to do that then we would just request that we continue with the deferred maintenance monies while we complete the assessment and then we would have to bring that back around We'll have to finish that 10 year that 10 year plan and assessment and then you'll see it in the following year's budget i mean unless there was yeah. unless unless you wanted to put funds into the r and r this coming year not knowing what what they recommend or what we recommend just to start a placeholder in that account that would be something that we talked about um, during budget time right and that, that's what i was assuming if the numbers don't come back we'll pay catch up next year for this year Yes, sir. But if we can get it all going, then I'd rather be moving forward. So I, I understand what you're saying. Did thank you, you. Are you good, Commissioner McDowell? I am. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'll entertain a motion. Whichever I'll, I'll one. make a motion, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that we instruct staff to implement the option one funding plan, which is to continue providing funds to address deferred maintenance problems now combined with an identified annual fund to meet facility predictive maintenance needs based on the assessment report. Second. I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Langdon, basically to direct staff to create a maintenance and renovation account for facilities and building maintenance following option one. Is there anything else to that? Uh, no, sir. Okay, and that was seconded by Commissioner Luke. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, your name's up here. Yeah, I just have a question to that motion. Um, I didn't hear the specific words of creating a renovation and maintenance account. Is, is, is that implied in this option one that was read? Let me ask a question to Mr. Speak or city manager. Does it matter what we call it? Doesn't. If I can speak to that, we in the language we need 
that yeah. it's an R and R fund creation. Yes. Okay. Let me amend my own motion then. Um, that we we continue providing funds to handle deferred maintenance now and create an R and R fund. Yes. Um, to meet facility predictive maintenance needs based upon your assessment report. I'll, I'll second that, uh, whether it's an amendment or whether it's a rewording, I'll second. City Clerk. How do you want it? Oh, uh, no, this is a question. <laughs> do you want to take down your first motion, recant your second, recant your first motion, start a new motion so the city clerk is clear down there? I think that's the way she was getting a little befuddled down there. So, you want me to start from the beginning? Withdraw your motion. I'll, I will, I'll, I'll withdraw my second. And I'll withdraw my motion. Okay, now let's start fresh. Thank you so much for keeping me on the path. That's, that's, um, that's okay. <laughs> I move that we uh, implement option one that we continue providing funds to address deferred maintenance problems now and create an R&R &R fund to meet facility predictive maintenance needs based on the facility's maintenance assessment report. And if you need something different now, I'm gonna be very upset. <laughs> and I second that, I saw his head going yes. Okay. No, I, I, I heard those special words, I just didn't remember them, but uh, I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor, and I'm gonna let you say it again. Um, I, I move that we instruct staff to implement funding plan option one, that we continue providing funds to address defer, deferred maintenance problems now and create an R&R &R fund to meet facility predictive maintenance needs based on the facility's maintenance assessment report. Thank you, and that was seconded by Commissioner Luke. And uh, Commissioner McDowell, your name's still up there. I don't know if that's from uh, the I just was going to say thank you very much for clarifying the motion. I do appreciate it. <laughs> you are now welcome. Now you see a big powwow going on right now. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Kim Williams, Finance Director. I was just coming, I, I heard the original motion. If we could keep it that way, keep the language a little bit general, so we have some flexibility and, and we can let our accountants decide how it ends up. Yes, I apologize. I love the I way understand. it was stated the first time, too, because it matched <laughs> option one. <laughs> right, and you know, our regular R&R &R funds, they're for replacements of vehicles. They are, it's, um, some of these projects we're talking about won't, well, it won't be a capital project. While it's large numbers, it's really repairs and maintenance. A lot of times that's operating budget. So we want to, again, keep it general. We know the intent. We know we want to be able to keep it, keep it and roll it to the next year. So let us work it out in accounting how that looks, if you don't mind. Well, We're going to have to like get you roller too. skates, Miss Kim, so you can get down here a lot faster when we're yes. doing this. <laughs> From the back of the room. <laughs> Okay, withdrawing your second, I'll withdraw my motion. If you withdraw your second, yeah, I think we need to ask the clerk how this is going to be best served. Because <laughs> let me, let me ask like a question. The motion that's the on our paper one. says, "I move to direct staff to create a maintenance and renovation uh, account for facilities and building maintenance following option one." Is that good enough? There we go. That's the way I was going to word you it. You want to pass your gavel, man? There you go. I'll make a motion. I move to direct staff to create a maintenance and renovation account for facilities and building maintenance following option one. Second. Oh, no, you got to follow through. Oh, I have to follow through. Okay, everybody. I have a motion on the floor. I, I have a motion on the floor to direct staff to create a maintenance and renovation account for facilities and building maintenance based on option one of the funding plan. Is there anything to that? No, ma'am. No, oh, but I'm loving watching you hold that. <laughs> She's wanting to beat something. I am. Yes. Thank uh, God let's I'm not vote. next to you. Let's vote. <laughs> I'm way down here. <laughs> and that motion passed five to zero. Why? Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, You're Commissioner. Welcome.
All right. Thank you, guys. Yep. Um, moving on, City Clerk, is there any online public comment? There is not. I have. And prior to adjournment, uh, Commissioner Luke. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would kind of imagine all the commissioners have read in the newspaper where Hagen Brody from the City of Sarasota Commission uh, is going to be approaching his full body Monday in their meeting about withdrawing from the sister city yeah. that they are joined with currently in Russia. Uh, if you read that article, you know that the city, Val Valdemar, I believe it is, uh, is the third largest stockholder for these missiles that they are utilizing. Uh, we have a very large Ukrainian population in our city. He reached out to them. They are going to attend to support him um, Monday in the meeting uh, to sever that uh, sister cityhood. Uh, I am wondering if we can get a consensus from our board just to not write a letter or anything, but just to get a consensus of us to support what he's doing and to show support for our Ukrainian community that will be attending that meeting. Heads up, he will state um, what the city, what our city has done in this discussion. Okay, is there any discussion here? Because I would like to go ahead. My, my I hit something and it's now funky. Wonky? <laughs> yeah. So this is to support Hagen's thing to remove? To, to separate that one sister city Right, to from separate Russia. a sister city. We don't have a sister city here, so. We do not. I'm trying to understand the. It's two prong. He was requesting how we felt as a commission because we have such a large Ukrainian community. So he wanted to hear the voice of this commission of whether they support that action or not. Plus, it's showing the support because the Ukrainian community has already said, we agree with that separation, and they're going to attend the meeting to show support of that separation so from that city. What would we city. do, send a letter? There's hardly enough don't, time to do don't a even, Don't even, I stated we don't even need to send a letter. Nothing. Uh, he, he just said he would like to hear the voices of this commission, and he will speak, you know, from his, right. his position on Monday. Don't mention it while the Monday. people from North Peru or from the Ukrainian exactly. community are sitting there to, as, to say, and, and the city commission supports this as well. It's basically oh. just a, if we had a, a five zero, it's a support in solidarity, and he will bring that up. So it's, it's our choice. Thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I just want to know, you know, how Can many... I get a consensus to um, show our support and solidarity for the Ukraines um, and support Hagen uh, Brody in his uh, endeavors on separating from their uh, sister city in Russia? Commissioner I'm a yes. McDowell. I mean, oh, you start down there. Okay. I went this way because okay. I was looking that way. Commissioner McDowell? As long as that's all it is, is the sister city. Yes. yes. Commissioner White? Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Luke? Yes. I'm a Vice, yes. And I am a yes. You got to 5 0 um, and pass that on to uh, Commissioner Brody. If I will, wish. and he might even be watching it currently. <laughs> <laughs> so. We wish him luck and, and we support his endeavors. So And we support that Ukraine community. I mean, uh, we, we support, had the raising yes. of the flag uh, earlier today to show our solidarity with, uh, with the Ukrainian population and what they're going through, knowing that their loved ones are over there fighting for the freedom of democracy in the entire world. And I mean, Ukraine is on the front, front line lines. for democracy and God love them. God protect them. Thank and you, sir. Personally, Amen. my thoughts and prayers are with them every evening. So, 
With that said, it is 3.20. I adjourn this meeting. See y'all back at 4. Okay.